Yo, 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 we are back with another episode of Ask Somebody Else, the episode or the weekly show where each and every week we talk to a different guest, an industry professional about property development, property investing and how they're getting on. We're going to be doing that today and we're going to be talking from somebody from Boxall Homes about investing in an area that they don't live in. Now, this is important because with property prices going up, increasingly particularly if you're from london or another of the big cities birmingham manchester in terms of investing so not your residential home but an investment property it can be really really hard to get on the property ladder so we're going to speak to somebody today who has been able to do this um yeah so basically we're speaking to somebody from boxall homes i have actually already been down to one of their development sites um and I had to Get them on board and speak to them today. All right, Kaz, how you doing, bro? How you doing? You all right? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad. I'm, I'm sweating. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit hot, but no, no complaints. I'm enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the weekend. Um, Mate, it's been good. We just what about you? How's your weekend beach, been? So we've uh, we've been swimming, topping up the tan. It's been good. Nice Sunday. That's good, that's good, that's good. So I was just giving the introduction to who you are and what you do in terms of one of the rings of things I want to focus on today is actually talking to somebody who does invest in the area outside of where they live because you actually live Close, in mate. Brighton, yeah, I always I say because it sounds better than, um, than Bognor Regis, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're on the south coast, so okay. in between like Portsmouth and Brighton, right down on the south coast, so yeah. Okay, nice. And obviously, when I met you, I met you in South Wales, in the valleys, and that's the area that you've chosen to invest in. Um, so before we get onto the actual area, what made you want to start well, investing property in property? In general, um, I, mate, it's always been like a long-term thing, the love of like bricks and mortar, interior design, and stuff like that. And um, I started by buying a project with a friend, and it was really just to get on the housing ladder, to be honest with you. And um, being from the South Coast, mm. like the barrier to entry is ridiculous. And it was ridiculous when we started. Um, so we brought a total project, like a 1950s um, build. It was in a really good location. And uh, yeah, we just, we just literally started like that. Me and a friend went um, uh, splits on the deposit and we sort of used, we used it as our resi for a long time mm. and then did the refurb. Um, in our spare time, like on evenings and stuff like that, and then cash flowed it from our day jobs. So it was a struggle, but that's how we really started. Um, and I used to live in South Wales um, and then just saw the opportunity there with the profit that we were going to get off the back end and thought, definitely this is my time to use, use the cash that I'm going to get from the profit to then invest. I sort of had that in the back of my mind from day one. Um, but yeah, it was then it's sort of a, I hate using the word journey, but it was a journey then like reading, listening to as many podcasts as I could. And then it sort of came at the right time. Lockdown came and I sort of just thought, right, this is my time to sink into everything and just listen to as many podcasts as I can. Sitting on the beach, reading books and yeah, yeah all self-taught. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, so that's how you sort of, started saying okay i know that property investment is going to be yeah. something you wanted to do more longer term um, with some of the projects that i've come to see that you've you've been doing what was the price of the first project that the first property that you so bought just to give in, people um, sort of an indication the reason why we chose south wales is a because i used to live there so i always knew the barrier to entry meaning the property prices were relatively affordable to get into that in, get into that initial investment so the first property we chose, it was 69.5K. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, particularly when, you know, if, if you're just used to operating in the area in which you live, so I, you know, house prices in London, you know, average, you know, property price is around £440,000 at the moment. The idea of even being able to buy a property for 69000 sounds really alien to some people and actually isn't something they're even aware of and where you can buy properties and how much. So it was 69000 In terms of, I know you mentioned you did used to live there, but how old were you oh, when you lived so in? So I um, moved there Wales? when I was about 10. Yeah, so I did sort of the last, mm -hmm. uh, I did a bit of primary school and then I did um, a 
bit of secondary school there. So, yeah, it was a big upheaval and, and moving into the primary school and then the secondary school there was a big difference. But um, I think we spoke about it when, when we did the filming. Um, I just saw my, my mum and her partner mm -hmm. at the time purchased a property and I think they paid like 75k for this like three bedroom semi-detached. It was a, it was a nice house, you know, and I can remember our family going, that's crazy. Like, that's mad. And it all, it just, it just stuck in my head, like, no, yeah. no barrier to entry. Um, and then the more I dug, I thought, like, the, these, these units will make a good investment. Like, return on capital employed, yields are really strong. So having that pot, I thought, yeah, it's the best, it's the best way to utilise that to get more. Okay, so then, so you've so you seen that property that you mentioned, so that, but even at that age, like you said, sort of doing end of primary school, beginning of secondary school, although you had the indication that, wow, mm. this is actually how much property costs in this area, you know, how did you actually do the research to understand, okay, I can buy properties for this amount, and if I spend a certain amount of money on them, I can get this level of uplift. Like, where did you do your research to actually really yeah, understand so the nuts and bolts of the was, area? It was in the, in the time when we, me and a friend were doing up the property on the south coast, I spent that time to just educate myself, look, listen to books, um, doing a lot of DD on the area to make sure that the rental demand was there, in, in the valleys, that is. Um, and it was all the signs was sort of steering to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Ringing estate agents, um, seeing what uh, per calendar month you can achieve. So really doing the DD before we even sort of step foot to do any viewings. It was all yeah. that background information that you have to do. So ringing estate agents, ringing letting agents, speaking to them how long has this been on the market for is is the tenant demand there in the areas that i'm looking at yes 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 and it just gave me the confidence then to go right let's book some viewings and let's get up there and start start viewing some properties so where did you see this first property yeah. that you found for sixty nine thousand pounds was, some, was that the open, the open market, market yeah. right in the poor and what was the condition Very like nice. of that property yeah, yeah. poor so, and how did you finance So if we take it back, deal? I just give the, give the listeners like an indication of yeah. what it takes, because it's not like, please don't be disillusioned. It takes a long time to find your first deal. It doesn't come like that. It takes like, so when I, when, when we did all the background research and did all the DD, yes, it, all, all the numbers on paper, on the laptop, on the spreadsheet work. So let's go and do some viewings. I then, because obviously me and Rach, I'm, I'm one half of Boxer Homes, Rach is the other half, she can't be here today, unfortunately. Um, but we um, yeah. just booked, obviously we work full time, so we were booking viewings on taking the day off work on a Friday, going up on a Friday, spending the night in a hotel, doing Friday, Saturday block viewings, and we were viewing... 10, five on the Friday, five on the Saturday, and doing that, and I think the total viewings that we had prior to me getting the offer accepted was something like 78 so it's a, it's a lot of groundwork and wow. we, we we didn't yeah. we, we offered on this property without even viewing on it and i wouldn't recommend that but once we did sort of like 75 viewings in my head i was thinking like we had a we had a video um walk around and stuff like that and i was like let's offer because the market at that time people were sort of steering towards property in a big, big way. And obviously we've all seen that in the last couple of years, people were just gunning for stuff and it got really hot really, really quickly. And I was thinking, if I don't make a decision now, we're not going to get something. So it was a case of like, yeah, offer in, bang, let's get it off the market. And we didn't even view it. We, we virtually viewed it. And obviously the estate agents, they're, they're, they're getting really funny now with that anyway. They won't sort of, take an offer until you've actually physically viewed the property or someone on your behalf has physically viewed it so we managed to persuade the estate agent look funds are in the account sent all the um offer from the bridge from from the broker showing funds in our account get everything over to them to to, to secure it to say that we're we're going to move forward with it with the deal um yeah like i say, i wouldn't advise that but in my head i was thinking i viewed 75 Welsh properties in the valleys how bad can it be? <laughs> I think I've seen it all. Like, let's just go for it. And sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta go for it. Yeah, no, that's it. And I think sometimes I have these conversations with people and obviously I always say that do all your due diligence, learn as much as possible. A lot of the time, if the deal makes sense, for example, and I always say you kind of got three stages, you've got sort of 
worst case, kind of probably yeah. average and best case scenario. If it still makes sense on a worst case scenario, i.e. you're going to make a little bit of profit, sometimes that is more valuable than sitting down, spending more money on courses, more money on education. Because what you'll learn in that first deal, whether that's the relationships you build, whether that's what you learn about yeah. managing builders, project management, the finance companies, the order in which you have to do things, a lot of the time you can't pick that up on a, you know, on a non-practical course. So I think... Your first deal, the important part isn't making a load of money. That would be amazing, but that's the cherry on top. If you can learn about the process, and once you learn about the process, like I was amazed to see how, when, when we drove around in Wells, I was amazed to see how many properties there were, you know, either up for sale or just sold um, or up for rent, et cetera, that there's, you know, a lot more properties that you can go and repeat the process at. So I think the first thing a lot of the time is just getting something over the line. And, You've got to pull the trigger. Cool. You really have. Yeah. And, and like I said, it, yeah. it got to the point where I was like, like you just said, best middle case, worst case scenario. Like, let's just go for it. And you, 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 you kind of work things out on the ground. And, and I, I'm quite, that's how I learn. And I don't think anyone should be afraid of failure. Like, you've just got to go for it sometimes. Sometimes off the back of our failures come the best successes. So you, you, really, you really got to get down yeah. and dirty with it. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, no, definitely, mm. definitely. I think we spoke about that the other day. Um, so you said you sort of around, you said almost maybe close to 80 viewings you had. How many offers did you put there's, in before? Was your first I mean, offer was accepted? To be fair, I, what, what I did originally, I sort of like went out and viewed everything. And I was viewing, I was viewing HMOs, I was viewing yeah. things that commercial conversions. And, and this, this has all come, this, it all comes from being a bit green, doesn't it? and being a bit wet behind the ears and going out and viewing anything and thinking like, oh, this is what I want to do. I'm going to just view everything because I think that's what everyone tells you to do. But it's not. Once you start sort of getting into that pattern, you start working out, right, this is my strategy. My strategy is vanilla by to let. So I want to follow the BRR method. I'm going to be focused on the terraced X minus houses. They're the ones that work for this model. So, right, let's, let's wean the viewings down into the stuff that I think is going to work from the images, from the descriptions, from the price point, from the end values, from the rental yield, stuff like that. And then the sort of the, the shortlist became a lot shorter. So I think I offered on about at least 58 of those properties, like, but a lot of them were just, it was pointless in viewing them because they, what, they didn't fit the model, but you only learn until you get out into the field and start doing that. So that was, when, when was that, when did you buy your, whole, uh, off, have your offer accepted on your first was, one? Uh, about 14 months ago. Okay, okay, so sort of late. Early 21, yeah. Late 20, yeah. Early 21? Early, okay, so first offer accepted early 21. Mm -hmm. Had that offer accepted, 69,000. What was your refurb okay. like on that project? 24K, you mentioned earlier. Yep that you got a bridging loan. Yeah. Um, are you happy to share what sort of loan to yeah, value did you yeah. do on that, um, on that, and on that property? And just for anyone listening, um, bridging isn't scary. Just so you know. <laughs> it's a tool. Well, yeah, yeah. It's a... No, no, no. Bridging using is a bridge isn't scary. If you haven't allowed enough wiggle room exiting a bridge on the back end and not meeting your requirements from your bridger, particularly depending on the type of bridge you're Correct. using, can be a little Correct. bit scary. You need to have an exit strategy in place. That's, that's the biggest thing. If, you, if anyone's going to go into using bridging finance, make sure that your exit strategy is solid, whether that to be flip the property or rent it out, remortgage, et cetera. So we use bridging. Um, we had a 75% loan to value on that. Um, and we did, uh, on that, we did rolled up interest. So if anyone doesn't understand what that means, you've got two types of interest on bridging. You've got rolled up interest where you, the interest, you, you get a slightly lower loan to value because you're paying some of the interest from day one, or you've got serviced interest where you pay the interest yeah. monthly, and that can be quite expensive. Um, but it depends if you've got less funds to go into the deal, that could be an option, but then then. It's also, you also need to consider that if you are doing serviced interest, then they would do an affordability check on you to make sure that you have 
the, 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 the income to allow you to pay on a monthly basis. And one of the reasons a lot of people use bridging, particularly earlier on, if you have capital, it's all about the risk and reward for the said lender. So they don't take into account how much you're earning, you know, as much as much depth on credit history, for example. It's all about do you put in enough money and does the deal stack to give the lender enough security that if you messed up, yeah. they wouldn't yeah, lose any same. money effectively. So obviously, obviously, the fees are a lot higher. So there is there is the entry fee you've got to pay for the bridges mm -hmm. solicitors. So that's another perhaps downside of bridging. You've got yeah. exit fees to pay. But um, we use a really good broker. I uh, don't mind shouting him out. Um, his, his name's uh, Ajay at yeah, yeah. Keystone Mortgages. Sure. Um, and he always said when we first sort of started, he mm -hmm. said, if bridging kills your deal, it's not a deal. Which I think is. Yeah, no, I think that's the same. Just, just to touch on that, that's the same in a lot of things. Like if, for example, your deal only works because you're a builder and are doing it at cost price, you're better off building and you're better off being a builder and doing projects Thanks. for other people and not putting your own money in. Likewise, if you have to try and find a way around stamp duty for the deal to make sense, or if bridging kills your deal, it probably doesn't make sense sense in the first place so just to go back people have come in and out so we're talking about mm -hmm. investing in an area that's not necessarily where you live or work so today we're talking about the valleys in south wells um we're talking about the first property that was bought approximately 14 14 yeah. months ago early 2021 it was sixty nine thousand pounds um with a twenty five thousand pounds refurb and you said your loan to value was approximately uh, yeah, 70 yeah, percent gross yeah. So it's about 63% net, which sort of quick maths means you had to have about sort of 24,000, yeah, something like that. So all in to do, you know, outside of the other costs, your other purchase costs, um, legal fees, etc. I would estimate maybe around sort of, like sort of bottom end 50,000, like sort of top end 60,000 for you to do that deal. And yes, I'm not here to say that's not a lot of money in terms of saving that amount. However, relative to what it would take you to do a deal in London or Manchester or Birmingham, it potentially is more achievable at an earlier stage. So how did uh, that first so deal we actually were go for you? squeaky bum time on the bridging. <laughs> we were literally rolled up to like yeah. we had it for nine months. And again, another learning. I would always take bridging for a twelve month term. I would never do bridging for nine months now. So we just sorry, just to touch on that, one of the reasons why is if you have the capital that can allow you to pay for 12 months, even though you pay the money rolled up in advance, yes, if you exit earlier, you get that money back. However, if you go over your term, a lot of lenders will say, well, you have to renegotiate, sign a new contract. And on signing that, they want their 1% arrangement fee if you're football or, or even 2% arrangement fee all over again. So even where you were borrowing £50,000, that 2% arrangement fee, you know, is, is costing a lot of money, a lot of money sort of day one if you, if you borrow that amount of money. So like I say, you need to a lot of learnings well. you learn on the ground. So yeah, so we literally, we, we got to the final hour on the on the remortgage. We got to like the eight and a half month stage when we finally completed. So it was, it was, uh, it was tight. Um, but yeah, we, we found things out that the, we, we didn't account for the refurb and, and all these things. I mean, I've got a background in construction. I'm, I'm a specification sales manager, so I work with a lot of developers. I work in that industry, um, and I'm quite hands-on anyway, so I like to really get to the nitty-gritty of everything and try and understand most part, move, most moving parts, most parts of a build, bricks and mortar, etc. But there's things when you do viewings you, you can't account for. There's, there's costs that you just want to start on earth and things. Yeah, I mean, the miners' houses are typically held now about... Yeah, they were built, they were built like years in, old. in the late sort of 80s, 90s, 1900s. And a lot of these properties were built with yeah. um, a lot of the waste material from the mines. So you used to get builders who used to drop off what they call slag material, which is old coal, old lath and stuff like that that they used to use for the subfloors. So there's most of the time there's no DPM, um, damp proof membrane on the floor. They use lath plaster, which... Once you start drilling into or breaking through, it just crumbles. Um, they, they're solidly built. Like when you were there, you saw how the width of the walls are ridiculous, but they penetrate damp. They're just uh, like a sponge for sucking up damp. 
I, I think the main thing is with a property you know, that's been standing for 100 years, a lot of the time there's going to be issues that you can't see, whether it's choice, yeah. like you said, whether it's the plaster, whether it's the roof, and there's only so much you can see. And particularly when the market is hot like it is now, it's a lot harder to do, um, you know, to do as much due diligence as you potentially want to do. And also with material prices rising, you want to make sure that you do have a significant contingency in any, you know, build or... 100%, 100%. And that was one of the stage. biggest learnings, like having that contingency and moving forward for the deals that we've done, we've allowed a lot more. Like we, we originally allowed sort of like 10%. We, that number is more like 15 now. Um, and it's just factored into our numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a reason why we also um, ran on for the bridging a little bit longer. So once we finished the refurb, obviously we, we unearthed a few things in that refurb. So it did end up taking a lot longer than we, than we first thought. Um, and obviously we were finding builders at that time as well. So that's probably a good thing to touch on. Um, we uh, literally <laughs> went in a bit blind and we, we, didn't, we didn't sort of uh, build a build team before we even purchased so we were inviting builders around inviting electricians around and trying to meet them and obviously that takes time so that eats into the time schedule of the project anyway um and we were quite fortunate enough to find some two really good multi-trades um it's it's a really good point actually i think we we've got a, a build team moving forward but we always use these two multi-trade guys and i think if anyone can get some good solid multi trades, and what I be what I mean by multi trade is someone who can do plastering, who can do carpentry, second fix, first fix, who can do um, the, the sort of your standard stuff. Obviously, you need qualified gas engineers to sign off, give you the gas certs, and the, your electricians to give you the EICR certificates and stuff like that. But um, having multi trades is is, is really key. Um, but we we also. Keeping stuff for the longer term, you're looking like sort of handyman and maintenance, you know. Yeah. So when we well. came to, we finished the refurb, when we came to remortgage on the back end, we instructed the broker to give us a remortgage. And we originally went with, um, I think it was TMV um, or TMW, sorry. They, they came out, they, mm -hmm. they gave us a valuation and yeah. we were sort of the end values. So the things were selling, we had um, a, literally a comparable next door. It was two bed and it sold for 97. So Ours was three, um, and we, we wanted um, uh, 110 end value, and I think that was more than justified what, what the sold data was in the area, um, less than a mile radius. Yeah. Um, and that's not sold subject to contract. That is physically sold, updated on land registry, because that's what surveyors look at. Yes. Um, and then they came out and they valued it at uh, 100K. So we were like, shit, that's not what we want. <laughs> um, so we then went back to the broker and we instructed a different um, mortgage company to come out. Uh, the original mortgage company used Connells. And I know Connells have been particularly sort of very conservative on their end values recently. Um, and we tried to swerve them as much as we can. Um, there was all the data there to show it was worth 110. Um, and then we, we, we managed to get that back out and Paragon came out and they, they valued it and they agreed 110 was, was the end value. So that's the reason why it sort of carried on. And again, sometimes, especially in the market we're in now with solicitors taking so long to do things and the process for the remortgage refinance is taking so much longer, unless you've got the time there, I wouldn't advise anyone to, to switch. I would just say you've just got to suck it up and go with it. Yeah. We've also, I think, sometimes it's the trade-off between with rates going up increasingly. Yeah. If you are looking to hold stuff um, longer term, and you're looking at when are the next rates going to go up, and how can you lock in a deal, you know, those, those rates in the pick, particularly on the more expensive properties. You know, I'm having rate change stuff that I was looking at in you know February, and now they're sort of four hundred pound a month on the interest payments. When you consider that's a five-year deal, that's effectively a Thirty thousand pound cost that has gone up from not tying in, you know, a product in territory versus doing it, really it now. I, I think so. The next thing to touch is obviously the fact that you are talking about on exiting that property. You're talking about, you know, what the surveyors are coming in to say or remortgage. That goes to show that your strategy has been to hold these properties. So you're not flipping them. You're not buying them. Selling them to add value. You want to hold these properties to effectively build up a, you know, yeah. a buy to let portfolio, however, limit the amount of your own capital you've got in each individual property. So how much do you left, left in this first one? So, 
so effectively own money you were at about sort of 11 percent, 11 percent, something like that of your like of an ltv of your yeah, own money and so the rest is the are like investment parameters um and they originally when when we first started we were sort of like people don't be disillusioned because the the unicorn deals are really 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 hard to come by and if you get one then hats off to you fair play but um like we, that that shouldn't stop anyone getting started and that was like a, a big thing for us when we start when we started looking we were sort of looking for these unicorns and we we quickly found out that that wasn't going to happen like if we wanted to expel some yeah. capital capital and get the train moving we had to then adjust our investment parameters so our parameters quickly changed mm -hmm. from no money in all money out all that jazz um to uh no more than 15k left in the deal we kind of want to work on around like a 35% yeah. return on capital employed um seven, roughly a 7% yield mm -hmm. um and then a cash flow of sort of like no less than 250 per calendar month net to us so it's sort of then when we started really looking um so i had a cash pot rachel had a cash pot that she saved all of her life rachel's a really really good saver i wasn't a very good saver so the the money that i had came from the first project um so we jointly put that together and then sort right let's let's run with this you know um and then we were we were happy because we see our portfolio as a long-term thing and that's what anyone building a portfolio should look at property is a long-term game um, and we are more than happy with getting that return back in three three and a half years max so we know after three and a half years there's none of our own capital tied up in any of our portfolio it's all sort of not well it's a free house essentially if you look at it like that you still get your 25 percent equity in there um but it's 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 a none of your own in initial employment of cash is left in that deal no, I think, I think one of the things, again, for people that are in here today to touch on is, you know, the importance of saying how something is possible, like yourself and your partner through you being in business yeah. and doing a property deal, then uh, saving, coming together, you've been able to actually actively invest in property, not, you know, do these, oh yeah, like unicorn deals, which basically means you put no money in and you get all your money back out and you go again, yeah. but doing a deal that makes sense for you and to break you mean about getting your own money back out it's effectively if you're saying your property is a cash flow and you're a minimum of 250 pounds that means they're making you three thousand pounds a year which means if you've got ten thousand pounds in a property you've effectively paid that yeah. back over the next three years and after that point, you've then got a property that continues to pay you that amount of money but with none of your own initial capital that you had day one into the property so it's a really good strategy to allow somebody to build a property portfolio actively um, which is good so sort of fast forward over the next 14 months because that's the other thing that i think is interesting about your journey you bought that property 14 months ago since then how many properties have you ever had have you bought or had offers accepted on and where are you with those projects yeah so we've got six now really um so we really sort of accelerated mm -hmm. after that first one um and then we we just we we built all these contacts like with the state agents um letting agents all around the area and we were getting we i i'm quite fortunate in the fact that i can, i work from home majority of the time um so i'm i've got laptops different screens i'm on right move and, and i get all the updates i've su subscribed to everything so um we i was getting updates i i had a good relationship with my builders and I was paying my builders to view houses for me. So when it, anything came up on the market, and all of our deals have been, uh, well, sorry, no, four of the deals that we purchased have been on market. Two have been off market, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute. But um, I was using the, the lads to go and view properties for me, give me a video walk around, and then offering off the back of that. So if you can build those relationships, then they're, they're worth their weight in gold because you can, you've got boots on the ground. Like I'm 250 miles away. So I can't be viewing all the time. And yeah. so we had that recycled cash back in our account. And off the back of the first one, it was almost a case study for me and Rach then to go to friends and family, to go to people who we've been talking about property investment for. And then that was the start of like, right, we need to raise finance. 
we if, if we want to accelerate our growth we really yeah. need to raise finance so that's when it all sort of started um with the raising finance uh, i think that's the other side yeah. of obviously the proof of concept of actually doing it that the concept of okay you know we can go and do this still means the benefit beyond just um you know the learning curve it's also the credibility amongst friends and families and associates the people that potentially you want to raise money from it's building those relationships of builders who you're actually paying to do things because they're a lot more likely to go and view a property for you for a fee or not on the basis that they're going to get work off the back end of that and also the estate agents who you're indirectly paying by buying properties through them are going to know that you have credibility that you do what you say you're going to do, that you deliver, and therefore they're a lot more likely to work. That's the most important thing you know, about in the doing future. that first deal. The, off, off the back of that first deal, you get, like you said, a case study, you get credibility in the marketplace, you build a build team, you've then started, again, it's a bit of a cliche, but a power team, you've got your broker in place, you've got a solicitor that you've already worked with, and then it's like that domino effect, isn't it? Once one's knocked over, you can start to then build a bit of momentum. Things don't get easier, like they don't. They, the, the, the stresses are there, and when you accelerate yeah. and then buy multiple properties, then things start ramping up, and then that's really a test of your spinning a plate, spinning plate ability. You know, so yeah, yeah, Keep, yeah. Keeping everything moving at once is chasing, chasing things. Yeah, and I think that's it. I think it's good to show a lot of people how it could potentially be done. People that are maybe sort of treading water for a little while at the moment and not doing things. I think I see it most commonly. I don't know if we've got any in here today, but with my estate agency friends, because they've seen some developers do some amazing deals, yeah. they always want the perfect deal. But on the other side, some developers do some rubbish deals. So a lot of the time they think of every, they've seen a lot of sales through, a lot of people pull out, a lot of time wasters. So they think about everything that could go wrong rather than things that you could do to make things go right. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to be thinking, how can I make this work? Because that's your job as an entrepreneur, not what could go wrong, but how could I mitigate my risk and how can I actually think, how can I make things work going okay, forward? So you said you've got so, so six purchases, or sorry, six properties at different stages. Some are completely finished, yeah. job done, they're now buy to lets. Um, you know, are in construction or going through legals. But what's your plan in the future? Like, where do you see Boxall Homes over the next sort of, well, I don't know what time from, but where do you see Boxall Homes going? What would you like to achieve? Do you have yeah, any milestones so that you're working give, towards? Yeah, we do. So, just some clarity. So, we've got two that are fully tenanted. Um, we just completed uh, on the project that you were, you were, came up to film. That's all done. Um, yeah. Happy to say that we got the end value that we wanted. So, we got one free five valuation on that which is great. Um, and I must say the finish is yeah. amazing. Like it's our best buy to let. It's, it's top of the top, but we, we really wanted to um, really sort of ramp up that rental value. And we knew the demand was there in, in the area that it was. And we thought, yeah, we'll spend a little bit more on the refurb to really eat that rental value up. So yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm really happy yeah. with that. And, the, and we use a different build team on that. So we started building a good relationship with um, Mainty Group. So we'll be using them again in the future. Big shout out to Craig. Thank you very much for a good job, sir. Um, and then... Yeah. Yeah, we had to meet Craig down with... Um, he did Tedge's yeah, fire yeah, damage house as well. One, wasn't it? I know he had some issues with uh, utility companies on that, which... Oh, that's the thing, man. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I have had uh, some serious issues with utility companies as well, and it's been the bane of my life. And going back to what I said earlier about spinning plates, once you start getting multiple projects on the go um, and silly little things that you think you boxed off because you spoke to, like when we get, when we get the completion, I like to get the keys, sort all the utilities out from day one, get everything sorted. If there's any debt, which there usually is, you have to sort out and then you have to send sort of yeah. proof of ownership, all that jazz. Um, and you think it's done, but when you come to, sort of the builders saying like I need heating now and the the the, the um the meter's not working. Oh my god, it was just we it just seemed to be we had four refurbs on the go and we still we've still got three on the go, a couple are coming to an end now, but it just seemed to be carnage on the phone for hours on end on hold trying to sort of stuff out because they hadn't wiped the debt and it was just like you told yeah. me you wiped the debt. You haven't it's 
Oh. I think there is. There's a lot of, it's like, particularly depending on how you manage your properties and manage your portfolio, manage your investments. Like, yeah, there's a lot of time looking for the right deal. And there's a lot of time doing investment. Yeah. Sorry, a lot of time looking to raise finance. And so, um, you know, managing the projects. But equally, there is a lot of administration in property. There's a lot of letters. Every property you buy, council tax, gas, water, electricity, you know, depending on if it's a HMO, maybe TV license. If it's a development, maybe you need new services. You need a TFL permit. You need, you know, all of these things that you have to consider. A new build, you need a new home's warranty, that guarantee. There's so many things to consider and so many things you have to tick off. I think definitely having a good process when it comes to administration in you know in the location it really is, is key. Really, really especially doing especially having your schedule of works for all these properties obviously we were quite we were quite um lucky that craig the the, the project wet was pretty much hands off that was really nice and then I, I had the other three that i was dealing with but yeah good solid schedule of works that you can send to your build team make sure they're on point they know what 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 needs to be done if there's delays on site for that particular project then they can access the other site to start works on there so try and make things things are fluid it, things never go to plan so sometimes you have to be like changing plans on a knee-jerk reaction and, and sometimes you have to do that 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 is the world that we live in with bricks and mortar and property investment it's 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 never going to be by the book and go to plan all the time but yeah you've got to have those administration things ticked off or, or or at least have a good process to manage them definitely go on go back to my question then in terms of what what are you looking for you've got your your ones that are progress are you still looking for more deals are you raising where are you at now and what are your sort of what are your sort of maybe next 12 to 18 so months, next 12 to 18 months like we want to build a uh I, I had in my sites like a get to a million pound portfolio by the end of the year and that's like nine units um i think we're gonna get at least two more by the end of the year at least going through legal was like i don't think we'll have the keys by the end of the year just because things are taking so long so we'll we'll have eight by the end of the year um and then uh i, I kind of want to we've got like a, a cash flow figure in our head of what that needs to be so i think that's that's around 15 units um for then us to leave our day jobs um i don't think i'll leave my day job for a good couple of years maybe three to five years just because i'm quite fortunate enough that i can manage both and i, I enjoy my day job um but the day will come eventually because we do want to move into other things but so next year um i'm looking at an essay business um so looking to diversify mm -hmm. and similar model brr um but then the end strategy will be to move into service accommodation um and not buy to let that's good i think again go back to what people are here for what people want to learn about a lot of people think okay yeah i want to be self-employed and i want to not have to work but i think a lot of the time it's a balance because having a good job particularly if you enjoy your job is leverage to be able to go and do different things and to try different yeah. things and actually borrow more and you know like your property journey the other thing as well is that if you've got a figure in mind from an income perspective the second you leave a job your income overall drops so potentially it's always looking at you know what do i actually want to achieve out of property what do i want out of sort of my time like how do i want to be able to manage it i think what you said in terms of having okay, this is the amount of cash flow I want. This is the amount of, you know, I want to build as a portfolio and actually having those goals because I always like an investment strategy to run in a race or just running in general. Really, it's not easy, but it's easy to start running, to start going somewhere. But if you don't know how long you're trying to run for and in what, in what sort of time you're trying to achieve that distance in, it's hard to gauge if you're doing well, if you need to speed up, if you need to slow down, where you're actually at within your own race. So I think definitely actually focusing on the goal can allow you to like, you know, keep track of where you are and make sure that you can achieve definitely. it. You don't, I think there's too much like noise in the marketplace that we, we operate in where people just like, you need to leave your job, you need a certain amount of cash flow, get, you, get rid of your nine to five, all this sort of stuff like that. And like, you don't have to do that. If you do enjoy your nine to five, then like you said, 
you're more credible from a lending perspective. If you're getting mortgages when, you, when, when you've just started taking a salary from your own limited company, it's, it, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle until you have at least, I think it's three years of accounts. Like, or, or, like, so you really are going to struggle. So don't be quick to jack that job in. Like That job, will you can leverage off the back of that. You can, um, you can build, albeit it might be a little bit, sl a bit, a bit slower than you originally planned, but sometimes there's, there's nothing wrong with just taking it at your own pace. I think we all get disillusioned, don't we, with Instagram and people. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up. You know, it's easy. Obviously, we have to remember that Instagram is a snapshot of people's lives or people's businesses, and it's always the best part. Everybody puts their best foot forward, but it's a case yeah. of just focusing on your own journey because I think I put something out recently to say the average millionaire still yeah. doesn't achieve it until 43 that means that you haven't got to look at, I haven't done it yet. You've still got loads of time. Some of the richest and most successful people in the world, like Warren Buffett, you know, um, you know, Richard Branson, Simon Cow, et cetera, you know, have tried and failed and done loads of different things where they made it at a later point. So I think you haven't got to worry about what other people are doing and just focus on your own journey. But I think that's a good place to sort of leave it. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed today. Um, for people that want to uh, reach out to you, where can they find Instagram, you? Uh, me and Rachel is at Boxall Homes, is B O X A L L Homes. Yeah, so yeah, it's been another great episode. Appreciate you all Not tuning sure. in. And Cheers, we'll catch guys. You next Thanks, week. Mate. Take care.